Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So it's it's me here. It's me here at City Hall, and I'm with uh, I'm with uh, Stephen Whitaker. Okay. All right. I'm going to open up the meeting. And uh, according to my clock, it's uh, 6.33 or 18.33, depending on how you count. Um, and uh, first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Uh, so I assume that everybody's had a chance to see it and look at it. Um, I move approval. I hear a motion for approval and a second by... A second. Thank you, Sally. All those in favor, signify by indicating aye. 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 Okay. And next item on the agenda is public comments. Is there anybody in the public that would like to comment? And I think that includes Doug and Joe and even Stephen. I'll comment if nobody else will. Okay. I think Stephen has a public comment. Okay. Once, once more is, uh, I'd like to be able to comment on the plan later on is that uh, it's discussed if it's appropriate, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Chief Chair. Uh, this is more of a process issue. The, uh, the warning, meeting warning was not sent to the city clerk nor posted in city hall. And that's that's a violation of open meeting law. And we need to be rigorously diligent about that, uh, especially when we're uh, uh, making efforts to legitimize public safety uh, organizations who seem to uh, wrestle with this issue. So uh, that's that's just for the record and for the minutes that we need to make sure that the towns, both Barry, Montpelier, uh, Capital Fire doesn't have a, a particular town hall to post it in, but that's the way the law reads. Understood. Understood. No, we can't have a valid meeting. What was that? Yeah, guy? but I don't think you're taking any binding action tonight, so. You can decide, Kim, whether you want a candidate or not. Well, I think we need a properly warned meeting to take binding action. I think you stated that accurately. Yeah, but you don't have any plan. I haven't reviewed the agenda. Do you have anything binding? So maybe wait and approve the minutes at a subsequent meeting. Or did you already do that? No, we have not gotten there. Yeah, I see there's a, a DocuSign account. Oh, no, those are just uh, balances. There's no, I don't know. You, you decide. You're running the meeting. Kim can advise you, Chief. Well, I'd like to hear what the rest of the board uh, feels about the issue as to whether we continue with the meeting or we cancel it for a subsequent date. I'm not sure that that's the right thing to do. But. I think we can continue. I mean, we've got two people here to discuss the, the project. At the very least, we owe it to them to, to hear what they have to say, I think. Oh, I, I totally agree. I agree with that. And we'll just withhold any formal votes till later. I want to hear what the people that showed up have to say. Absolutely. All right. And I think we should hear. From Rick, I think earlier we discussed it's been 15 minutes or so on an outline. But I want to hear from the Barry folks. Because um, I think they have a lot to say about this project. All right, having, uh, having discussed that a little bit there, let's uh, move on to the next item. Uh, let me back up. Are there any other public comments? <clears throat> Not hearing anybody that wishes to offer any public comment. Glad to see you, Steve McKenzie. Um, we we'll move on to the next item, which is to approve the minutes of June 10, 2021. Will we pass that? 
Sally, you're going to be the designated second. Yeah. Second that. Motion made to approve and second. All those in favor. Doug, Doug, you you missed Kim. You didn't hear Kim's comment. He said we should pass that because you don't have a proper warning. You shouldn't be taking any votes. I think all we should do is hear from Televay and comment on the plan. Is that a legal opinion, Kim, or is that just an opinion based on how you feel? No, you? I, I think we don't have a valid meeting and we shouldn't be taking binding votes. Well, we can deal with the minutes another time. I think the business of this meeting is to hear from the dairy folks that have put so much energy and thought into this. I want to know what they think. Okay, in the interest of uh, moving along and not delaying us anymore, the uh, third item on the agenda approval of the minutes is tabled until the next meeting. The fourth item on the agenda was the approval of payments to Paco, Donna, Brent. No, Paco and Televe. Brent has. Brent has distributed the uh, documents to all the board members for a DocuSign. I've signed it. I've seen where some others have signed it. Uh, Brent, has, Brent, has that pretty much been done? Yeah, it's uh, everyone except everyone except myself has signed it, coincidentally enough. So that's where we're at. Okay. I think there's enough approvals. And unless anybody objects, can we get a motion to approve the pay payments? He's missing, he's missing the point. I'm not, I'm not going to object, but I think it's a problem without a valid meeting. I think these folks should be paid. We have an approval or not? There's a motion to put it. Is there a motion to approve payment? I'll move it. <clears throat> Anybody second it? No, I'm not. I'll second it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Move on to item number five, which is Televate Telecom Report presentation by, by Rick and Dominic. Uh, very glad you guys are able to get up here and join us today. And uh, look forward to hearing what you have to add to our discussions. So I'll turn it over to you two guys and do what you got to do. Thank you, uh, Thank you Mr. Chair, for sitting, sitting chair. Is this, um, and, and so before we get started, uh, I, and we, will, we have a presentation and uh, be happy to bring it up. But be, before we get started, um, on behalf of uh, myself and Dominic and everyone at Televate, we really, uh, you know, appreciate, we want to share our appreciation to, to CVPSA and to all the dedicated public safety leadership and other professionals who support it and participated in the needs assessment project. Uh, I, I can tell you that Dom and I are very impressed with the, uh, the dedication and commitment um, of, of all of the folks that participated in this project. We're very grateful that they made themselves available, uh, openly shared ideas and recommendations and information. Um, and um, you, know, you, you folks are, uh, are very amazing for what you do to support your community and, and, and the safeguard the public safety uh, uh, and the first responders who uh, utilize the, the, the Central Vermont communication systems. Um, so you know we're we're just uh, we're very fortunate to be able to support you in your uh, assessment of your 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 current status and and to help uh, provide um, ideally have provided some recommendations that that will you know further support. Uh, your endeavor to uh, you know to address existing gaps in communications for public safety and your and the communities you serve. 
Dom, anything you want to say before we get started? Well, no, I certainly uh, echo those uh, comments, Rick, and uh, also want to thank uh, the team for their uh, outstanding hospitality uh, during the time uh, I was on site, reviewing the site, uh, uh, the site locations and taking measurements and uh, I uh, got a ride from Joe on his four-wheeler, and uh, we just had a great time. <laughs> so with that said, I want to bring up the presentation. However, sharing has been disabled, so whoever set up the, the, the Zoom meeting has got to facilitate uh, screen sharing. <clears throat> I'm trying to do that right now. Thank you, friend. We have our chief technician that's going to take care of that. Oh geez, I wouldn't call me that. That's... Looks looks like that could looks like that that's okay now. I, I, yeah, it just came uh, up. Yep. Okay. So yep. you're able? Are you are you good? Yep. You uh you did it. Okay. Whatever you did worked just fine. All right. So let me see. Let me get this screen shared. Let me know when you could see it. I'll as soon as you tell me you could see it, I'll put it in the presentation mode. Yep, I can see it. I I can. See it. All right. You can all see a larger screen now? Yep, that's better. Thank you. All right, very good. Okay, so so Dom and I are going to uh, we're going to uh, share um, different aspects. So uh, I'll get us started. Dom will uh, participate in the middle and then and 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 uh, then I'll take over and both of us will will conclude. Um, so um, you know, uh, you know this project here. Uh, what we what we're about to uh, to uh, convey to you verbally um, that you know we we summarized our, our report, and um, I don't know if any of you have had a chance to review it or or skim it or studied it and have if if you have uh, no one sent us questions in advance. But um, you know I I think what we have. Uh, we were were suggested that we do is, is that members of the board can ask questions at any given time and other questions could be left to the end but i mean we're willing to entertain questions uh, however you you best think uh, but um uh with with that said um yeah, steve go ahead steve yeah, I just I, I i'm sorry I, I i got in late i just wanted to double check is the meeting being recorded doug well i have to ask Run that. Yes, it's uh, it's being recorded by Orca by yep. Orca Media, so that should be we should be good to go. Uh, great, thank you. Okay, so with that said, uh, we're going to review the project objectives, the project scope. Uh, we'll talk to you about the you know the interviews and the data gathering. Um, uh, present key findings, recommendations, and next steps, and 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 then certainly an open discussion. But as I said, uh, you know the content is uh, is very familiar to most of you, so um, you should be you should you certainly know where we're going and what we're talking about. But but don't hesitate to ask any questions. Uh, we can entertain those uh, uh, and still maintain the pace. There so I mean the, the the goal really here is, is recording that, you know, in progress. I'm recording on my end too. Okay. Got it. Sorry about that. It's all right. I'm going to shut down the, I got to hide this. Uh, the, the, all the, all the, the videos are covering my presentation. All right. So let's see what we got. Let me go back to the slide. All right. So in terms of project ob ob objectives, uh, I, the the CBA is CVPSA uh, request for proposal. It's very thorough. It's a I mean it's a comprehensive document, and and basically our our objectives were to document and assess existing public safety communication systems and solutions. And as part of that effort, we certainly assessed the central uh, fire mutual aid system, uh, the Montpelier uh, radio communication systems, and the and the Barry City communication systems. Evaluated radio networks uh, and 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 dispatch capabilities. Uh, Dom had a had the opportunity to uh, to conduct a few days on site uh, radio site visits and um, and and also visit dispatch centers and others. And so we we were able to uh, you know gather and document the information uh, about your existing systems. 
Um, also, our goal was to identify gaps in these systems um, and tend to determine options and costs to upgrade the systems to meet the end user requirements. Um, and we've, we've endeavored also in this presentation to provide um, some, some clear uh, next step recommendations uh, for you to guide, guide you along this process. So these, these are the high level tasks. Uh, the, the way the, the RFP was written, there were um, two primary tasks stated. And then within each of these, there was a number of subtasks and um, we addressed each of those subtasks uh, within our, our, our report. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, I, I think this, this just, this just clarifies the goal to complete a region-wide assessment of existing public safety communication systems and defined stakeholder requirements, and then propose solutions with design and cost estimates for re resolving indoor and outdoor radio dead zones in Barry City, Montpelier, and for the CFMAS uh, service area. So that was what, what was documented there. Um, this uh, service area map uh, we created along the way through our interviews. Uh, um, to indicate, you know, who was responsible for for serving what areas, and um, uh, that there's a, a number of, of documents that we've created along the way that will that will be valuable to to you, and we'll you know we'll transfer them over to you um, uh, after after this presentation over the next few days. So what I wanted to do is, uh, for those of you who are, are familiar with, or, or and those of you who are not familiar with, the interoperability continuum, uh, this the interoperability continuum is, a, is an important, um, you know, represents a best practice guide for advancing public safety communication systems and practices to reach a, a greater state of regional or local interoperability. And, and this this uh, inter, this continuum has actually been a guide to uh, many jurisdictions and and to us as a company in in, a, in assisting uh, jurisdictions and regional independent local and and, and regional and statewide uh, efforts uh, on advancing interoperability so there's there's you know those these uh, five key tenants uh, governance um, you know, which CVPSA has really done a good job of, 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 of developing our governance, um, a standard operating procedures to guide use of, uh, of, of communications and how you communicate with whom you communicate, when you communicate with them um, during day-to-day -day and, and, and large-scale events, um, the technologies that, that public safety uses to, uh, to uh, advance uh, public safety communications, and there are there, there are two breakdowns here. One is uh, is on the data elements, um, and so it's bifurcated through data and through voice, and and you know basically you know we swap radios or we have a gateway or shared channels or a proprietary shared system or standard based shared system. There are these these are. Uh, 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 basically milestones that you would reach to achieve the highest level of interoperability. Then we've got training and exercises and, and then just use uh, of the networks. And so whenever Televate um, supports our, our public safety uh, clients on their, uh, public, on their communication requirements, you know, this is really a foundation for us that so we can assess where you are relative to these tenants and then to provide uh, recommendations and, and and solutions to advance communications along the way. And so this is a, this document was developed or this, this continuum was developed a number of years ago um, by the Department of Homeland Security and has become kind of a, a, a standard best practice for all of us in this industry. Any questions about that? All right, so with that said, let me talk uh, about the stakeholder requirement survey. So what we did is what, we facilitated interviews, um, direct interviews with stakeholders, and we also conducted an online survey. Uh, the idea of the online survey was to broaden the scope to give uh, more stakeholders in the community an opportunity to provide information. Um, and and we, you know, we we had a successful online survey, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, basically, the requirements was uh, based on regional public safety stakeholders. 
and other interested uh, party participants. And, and, and I'm, I've got a list of who participated in that. Our goal is really uh, to facilitate an open discussion and communications to define critical requirements for public safety communications and identify the gaps. And, and importantly, we wanted to use this as a means to build constructive relationships. Um, you know, we, we uh, Dom and I took a, a, a great deal of effort to uh, develop questionnaires and, 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 and to facilitate conversations uh, and to, you know, build some trust within the community. Um, you know, coming in as an outsider of the community, uh, uh, experts in the industry, we wanted to be sure that we were able to convey our knowledge and to uh, ensure that the community was uh, felt good about sharing their ideas with us. And so we had a, a, a great, great participation from all the stakeholders. So it really turned out to be a valuable exchange of ideas and information. Um, and, and certainly supporting that, I mean, and, and, and Joe Aldsworth and, and others were really instrumental in providing us uh, um, uh, you know, a, a tremendous amount of information about the existing systems. It, it, it was, uh, it took us a little bit of time to get it all straight, but we eventually uh, figured it out. And uh, so we, it was very, it was documented, but the, the information that was provided became the foundation to the, uh, uh, um, you know, to the ongoing work. So in terms of information and requirements gathering, here are uh, those that we had direct uh, uh, conversations with. And, um, you know, um, from, from obviously the key leadership uh, in public safety on the fire and police side, um, um, medical services as well, and, and potential partners in the region, CV Fiber and West Washington Electric, um, the Vermont Electric Company. Um, to other interested parties and stakeholders in the community. I, I was really uh, grateful for uh, Carl Rinker to uh, participate. He, uh, he operated and owned a number of radio towers and he's since retired, but you know, he made himself available. Joe uh, also reached out to him, made himself available. And we had a good conversation with him about you know, his thoughts on, on available radio towers for, you know, for the network. So, you know, we, we really had a, 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 an important um, and, and very a, a involved uh, participation from the stakeholder community. And the information that they provide us really created the foundation for, for the report and, and, you know, documenting of requirements and recommendations. So Rick, in terms I have of, a question. Yes, sir. Do you have an inventory of the equipment? We have an inventory of some of the equipment. I'll, I'll let Don answer. Don is better at answering that because he did he did the site visits. Don, are you available? I'm sorry, I was on mute. Uh, yes, we have a high level inventory of the uh, equipment at the sites, uh, the site locations, and the equipment there. Uh, we have a uh, rough estimate from the survey of the uh, user equipment, the mobiles and portables. Okay, I, I noticed you said we needed approximately 250 new radios, but do you have an inventory of the ones that need to be replaced? No, we don't. We, no, we do not. No, the, the, those numbers were provided um, by um, by the stakeholders. So we, you know, the, we we didn't our our pros, our program wasn't capable of identifying all the existing radios. But but um, Joe and others provided um, um, numbers that that we you know we took as uh, as as a basis for for estimating the cost to replace those radios. Sorry about that. I jumped ahead of the slide, um, but as you can see, we you know we had uh, what is it a total of uh, uh, 20, 30, 30 responded responded to the survey, and and as you can see on the left, um, that's who the responders were. I mean, the Capital Fire Mutual Aid uh, participants were were you know definitely the the most uh, represented the most of the responders uh, to the survey. Um, and 
We did include in the report in an appendix uh, a, a, an assessment of, of the those who participated in their comments. So that is in the report as an appendices. And we, you know, we summarized some of their responses, but we took into consideration uh, everything that was told to us through an interview, as well as what was provided to us um, via this survey. All right, so with that said, um, yeah, I want to talk about uh, requirements and recommendations that, that came out of the report, uh, came out through the findings, uh, um, through the, you know, what we interviewed and what we defined as the requirements of the stakeholders, and then, you know, recommendations that we developed um, within the report. And I'm going to I'll let Dom uh, take over uh, for this section here. Great. Thank you, Rick. You're welcome. Uh, yes, it was it was obvious as uh, we talked with uh, the stakeholders, uh, right? Uh, uh, as we were talking with the stakeholders, identifying a number of specific uh, requirements, and that led us to uh, various recommendations uh, that were quite evident as we worked through the project. Uh, certainly, one of the uh, primary uh, recommendations and key items for improving uh, communications within Central Vermont uh, for the uh, fire and EMS uh, personnel was a regional uh, system, a regional LMR system. Uh, of course, that should be standards-based, uh, P25 capable. Uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, public safety communications know that P25 is standard, uh, developed uh, many years ago by EPCO and it has uh, been adopted by numerous agencies and uh, it is currently a requirement to comply with P25 in order to receive uh, some funding uh, sources. Uh, so certainly uh, P25 is a recommendation. The uh, network we would recommend would be uh, what we call dual mode or be able to support both P25 or analog uh, communications. Uh, your current system is an analog uh, system. So the radios uh, in use today support analog. Uh, so having both uh, would allow you to do a, a gradual transition as radios can be replaced and that are P25 capable. Uh, of course, we wanna, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the number of sites and the base stations and towers in order to provide sufficient coverage throughout the service area. Uh, there is currently interference uh, experienced on the uh, uh, Capital Fire system from other users of the same channels in different parts of the state and northern part of the state as well as uh, experienced from Canada as well. Uh, so certainly having sufficient channels and interference free channels is a key necessity for reliable public safety communications, as well as full uh, dis dispatch channels. Uh, currently, uh, something we uh, don't see too much any uh, uh, very often, but uh, currently the uh, Capitol Fire and the City of Barrie Fire use the same frequency for dispatching and communicating from the field. Uh, it's not a frequency pair, as we typically see, it's a single frequency used in what's called a simplex mode. So the same frequency is used to dispatch, to page, and to talk back to dispatch from the field. Uh, that creates congestion and some self-interference and a recommendation is to migrate to a, a simulcast repeated system as we'll discuss a little bit later. Additionally, to extend the coverage, we recommend uh, utilizing vehicular repeaters. And also there is a concern of uh, being able to monitor uh, activities on, the, uh, on scene, on the fire ground. So we recommend additional receivers for the tech channels so that dispatch can monitor activity. The dispatch yeah. consoles used- uh, Dom, Dom, can I chime in before you move on? Absolutely. So, I, I, I'd like to be really direct here. Your, your current radio network is, is, is certainly uh, not serving the needs of your first responders in your community. It, it, is, uh, it, it is barely functional. 
Um, and the way it is functional is because the year, there's been a, a, a tremendous workaround. Um, you know, uh, your, your first responders have figured out how the network works and, and how it doesn't work. And, and they've employed some, uh, some creative means to ensure that they get communications delivered both from, simul from the dispatch centers um, to and from um, the, uh, the first responders in the field. So it, it is, um, your network is, 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 is certainly at great risk uh, to, to your communities and your first responders. So the way it's currently configured. And I, I, don't, I don't think I'm telling you anything that, that, that was not known before, you know, before we were asked to come in and do this report. But, but uh, I just wanna, the recommendation here is, is that networks and, and, and there's actually, you know, the way it's designed, it's a, you know, they're, they're, they're independent networks. So uh, they, they work together, but, uh, but what the cities have and what CFMAS have are, 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 are really, you know, just barely functioning in my opinion at this stage of the game. Yeah, I absolutely uh, agree. It's uh, just a, t a testament to the uh, public safety team there in the area that they've uh, uh, been able to make it as effective as it is. But uh, uh, the, the tools that they have uh, at their disposal right now are uh, uh, far from state of the art. Uh, also, we would recommend upgrade to dispatch consoles. Uh, there are uh, both the, uh, the consoles used at both the dispatch uh, facilities, both the city of Montpelier and Barry City are out of uh, manufacturer service, uh, no longer supported, um, and, they are, and they are different uh, uh, manufacturers, different models currently. We would recommend uh, common uh, consoles to facilitate uh, backup and redundancy, and also, of course, uh, upgrading to get current equipment that is uh, supported by the manufacturer and not uh, subject to, to failure. Also, one of the key things that the Central Vermont team has done there is uh, created a connection, a fiber connection between the two PSAPs, between the Montpelier and uh, Barry City Dispatch Centers, which has helped uh, certainly in coordination and use of that uh, single frequency resource and reduce congestion some. Uh, we certainly applaud that uh, activity and we recommend uh, making that uh, uh, circuit redundant uh, because that's going to play even a more important part in the uh, recommended uh, regional system. So before we move on, uh, we also, there was a recommendation both from dispatch and from, you know, fire and the police regarding a, a, a computer-aided dispatch system. Uh, the, what you currently have is more or less a records management system, the Valcor system, and um, it is not a, a, a standard CAD system. And um, you know, dispatch uh, certainly is more effective when they operate utilizing a CAD system. Um, so what we, we did find out, um, Paco informed us earlier this week that that the state of Vermont um, has advanced a relationship with Valcor to develop a CAD, and and there's information uh, uh, that Paco is going to make available about making that CAD system available to local jurisdictions. So we should follow up on that uh, because you know it's been rec we rec it's been recommended was requested and recommended we recommend that you have one, um, and perhaps there's a uh, there's a shortcut to getting it through a collaboration with the state of Vermont. Right. Along with the upgraded uh, system that we are recommending, the regional LMR system, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we would recommend uh, that, that the radios be uh, replaced as well. Uh, many of these radios have uh, served uh, uh, their users for many, many years and uh, are uh, reaching end of life and uh, also to support uh, uh, the additional features and to support the recommended P25 standard. And we would recommend updating uh, the radios and also having a cache of spare radios uh, that uh, would be used for uh, distributing to additional uh, potential users during a critical incident or to uh, other users who uh, have come in from outside of the central Vermont area to assist in a mutual aid scenario. 
also on the police side, while the, uh, the police uh, system is uh, uh, operating uh, and for the most part meeting the needs of the law enforcement within central Vermont, uh, there are additional requirements for uh, an additional site to improve coverage, primarily in building coverage. Uh, the coverage requirements of uh, the uh, city uh, of Montpelier and uh, uh, Barry PD are much more limited than uh, the fire, uh, the capital fire requirements, of course, because they go out uh, uh, throughout the entire county. Uh, the city requirements are more limited, so generally meets their requirements, except in in-building situations. Uh, some of the additional sites that we are recommending for the fire regional system could potentially be used to enhance coverage uh, within the city of uh, Montpelier. Also for additional uh, coverage enhancement, uh, vehicular repeaters would also be a good uh, uh, instrument uh, to use for, for police. And uh, finally, uh, we recommend uh, uh, creating a regional task force to help in increase interoperability throughout, uh, throughout the area, uh, both for the city, uh, police, uh, uh, the county, and state uh, as well. Can I ask a, a question? Just uh, the, the term interoperable or interoperability. Can you explain what that means to a neophyte like me? Uh, interoperability uh, refers to the ability of different users or different agencies to be able to communicate together effectively. Okay, uh, sir, uh, just to add to what Dominic's saying, we, we uh, have an ongoing, and, and we're resolving it, but we've had an ongoing problem in, the, in, in the, this country regarding public safety communications. Um, agencies uh, were using VHF, UHF, 700, 800 megahertz. Some are conventional, some are analog simulcast, some are trunk, uh, some are full simulcast systems. So the, the variety of different uh, technologies and frequency bands that are used has created disparity between uh, first responders and their ability to communicate with one another. Um, for example, even in central Vermont and throughout the state of Vermont, um, you have uh, fire departments in central de uh, Vermont on using the VHF frequency. However, the, the police are using uh, the UHF frequency. Right. So uh, uh, in order to facilitate a direct radio to radio communications with uh, between those two um, uh, disciplines, you, you have to build a bridge, uh, a gateways. And so um, the same is true, uh, not just, uh, and, and, you know, it's between the regional and the state. So uh, within your own region, you've got the capital, the, the capital police, um, and, and you've got a number of first responders from, um, from on the fire side and police, and they all have different radios and frequencies. Um, and so, you know, you have challenges today um, in, in, in facilitating a communication, a, a, an, an interoperable communication between them. On the data side, it gets a lot more challenging on data, but just on the radio, you already have some challenges within your own community. Uh, thank you, that helps. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Pleasure. On this, um, <clears throat> I wanted to bring out too, for, for on the police LMR, um, the, the, the Montpelier Peace, the police chief did put in his budget an additional radio site, um, and and you know we were able to review that, um, and they, it also requested some additional vehicle repeaters. The, the police in Montpelier do use some vehicle repeaters, but they're not in all their vehicles. Um, the, the third item on the tactical uh, force um, that's in the regional tactical force. They also have disparate uh, radio communication issues that have to be addressed. Okay, Dom. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> yes, sir. Another opportunity to enhance the public safety communications within the region is to uh, utilize, make, make utilization over, of uh, broadband systems and applications. Uh, as many of you may be aware, there is a, a current trend uh, for uh, public safety agencies to embrace uh, broadband uh, communications. And there are 
many applications being developed that support uh, 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 police and fire operations. Uh, some of those uh, uh, that we are uh, that we commonly see are situational awareness applications uh, that uh, assist law enforcement uh, departments. Uh, building plans and, and pre-plan op, uh, opportunities that support uh, fire departments and also uh, the capability to uh, transmit, uh, 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 securely transmit patient information for EMS departments. Uh, those are some of the applications. Uh, those, uh, this of course does require uh, broadband connectivity and uh, broadband cellular coverage which uh, is a challenge in the central Vermont area, much as the uh, uh, LMR coverage is, uh, but there are ongoing efforts to improve that. Uh, there is a, uh, an organization known as FirstNet, the First Responder Network Authority, uh, which was uh, developed, uh, which was instituted by an act of Congress back in 2012 to enhance broadband communications for public safety. Uh, there was a, uh, a plan put together for each state to enhance the coverage and to provide a priority access for public safety for broadband connectivity. So we would encourage uh, the state to uh, work with the chosen provider for FirstNet, which is AT&T, work with the chosen provider and the FirstNet authority uh, to get regular updates on the uh, improvements in coverage that uh, that FirstNet and AT&T are working and provide input uh, to FirstNet to help improve uh, coverage within the central Vermont area. Once you have re uh, more reliable broadband uh, net, uh, network, you can implement some of those applications I discussed earlier. Uh, another application is push to talk over cellular, PTT over cellular, and a special uh, um, uh, condition of that at which is mission critical push to talk, which is directly applicable to, uh, to public safety. Uh, once you have coverage, those types of applications can be used on uh, responder smartphones and can help uh, improve the uh, access to, uh, to push to talk services for, uh, for the users and can potentially expand the coverage of of the LMR system to other areas that could be uh, covered by a broadband system. <clears throat> so we would uh, recommend developing a strategic plan to address these issues, uh, the coverage, the specific application requirements by the different disciplines, uh, how the data will be uh, controlled, how it will be housed and secured, and also uh, how it will, can be shared between agencies. Yeah, and if I could add to that, the, the, we, we brought attention to both the push to talk over cellular and the mission critical push to talk. The mission critical push to talk application capabilities uh, are, are only going to be offered by FirstNet. Um, push to talk over cellular is also offered by Verizon and AT&T. Um, so AT&T FirstNet, um, um, they, they'll, uh, they'll provide a mission critical push to talk. Um, but there, there's uh, in your, your, the number of communities that we work in, Verizon is much better uh, a provider of broadband service. So in those environments where Verizon is better, push to talk over cellular is a, is a preferred application for, for push to talk um, over the broadband networks. The, uh, the, the push to talk over cellular, a mission critical push to talk can be interoperable with your LAN mobile radio network. So users that have those applications and services on their smartphones can have a direct connection and communicate directly with uh, LAN mobile radio users who are um, responding to an incident or otherwise. And that's the advantage of these. They give you uh, uh, another tool uh, in your, your communication chest that can be used. The, uh, unfortunately, though, the, the, the issue for Central Vermont is that outside of your, your, your city environments, um, the, there's not good service. So you don't have reliable uh, broadband service from any of your providers throughout the extended geographic area. So, um, you know, there may be these, the use of these might be restricted to uh, managers, uh, to leaders, to chiefs and deputy chiefs, but 
but it is an evolving tool. It's a lot cheaper than buying a radio in some cases, but um, it does provide you a, a, a other a potential alternative to uh, provide um, interoperability with LAN mobile radio. All right, Tom, you want to keep going? Sure, absolutely. Another uh, area that we explored uh, in, and, and uh, documented in the report was the opportunity to partner with other central Vermont uh, entities. Uh, certainly the uh, improvements that we are recommending uh, that are necessary for public safety communications within the area uh, require assets and uh, require uh, uh, ways to implement them. Uh, there are other entities within the area who have uh, similar uh, objectives and require similar connectivity and communications. Uh, we spoke with uh, a number of them and we did confirm that there are opportunities for uh, sharing of uh, assets and, and sharing of objectives. Uh, CV Fiber is uh, one entity that is deploying broadband connectivity to various areas throughout the state, including the central Vermont area. Uh, they are focusing on currently uh, underserved or unserved areas. And we did evaluate their uh, uh, proprietary, under an NDA, we evaluated their proprietary build-out plans and found out that there are some potential opportunities uh, to provide connectivity to some of the proposed uh, communication sites that we are recommending for the regional system. Similarly, uh, Washington that, that uses LMR communications as well. So they have radio tower assets and there's also a potential uh, for uh, cooperating with them as well. Uh, we spoke with them. They are uh, uh, interested in working with uh, the CVPSA and helping out public safety uh, however they can. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, Velco or Vermont Electric Power uh, also has a statewide uh, radio system for their operation. It is an LMR system. Uh, they have a number of towers in the central Vermont area. We specifically, uh, they identified three towers uh, that are recommended for the regional system. Uh, which they have uh, fiber or, and or microwave connectivity to. So that's a very key, uh, um, key issue uh, be because not only is it uh, required for the uh, regional system to uh, outfit and develop a, a number of tower sites, but we also must have connectivity to those. Uh, obviously they all need to be connected into a regional network and given the terrain in the central Vermont area, the connectivity is uh, challenging as well. Uh, but they did uh, identify three specific towers uh, that are, are currently proposed for the regional system where they have connectivity already. That could be a very huge asset uh, to the uh, CVPSA as they look to build out a network. Uh, given that they have mi microwave, uh, it's possible to share that microwave and not have to add additional antennas to the towers at those sites. And as Rick mentioned earlier, uh, there's the opportunity for uh, the uh, CAD system that uh, we recently found out about just this past week uh, from the Valcor system, the uh, opportunity through the state and the state may have access to radio towers as well. So, so there certainly are opportunities to cooperate with a number of entities to help achieve uh, the goals of improved public safety communications within central Vermont. All right, so um, I'll take over for a little while. Um, uh, you know, what we want to talk about is certainly regional interoperability. Um, uh, you know, in, in order to achieve broad communication capabilities across a, a, a wider area with a number of jurisdictions, a number of disciplines, uh, documented communication plans are certainly recommended. Um, you know, what channels, what frequencies, um, um, who, who communicates with who, how do we communicate with them? Um, it, it's good to really have uh, detailed documented communication plans and then to maintain a, a annual uh, a periodic uh, communication training and exercises to ensure that 
that all the users understand how to use the radio, under what conditions, what channels, um, who they can talk with, and, and both uh, tabletop and, and physical exercises uh, um, are, are, be, are beneficial. And we would recommend that, you know, that you, uh, you undertake those uh, beyond what you have been doing. Some work has been done, uh, but it'd be good to en en enhance it and do it uh, with an extended group and, and do it more frequently. Um, certainly, uh, operating procedures, uh, um, network operating procedures are valuable. And um, in building a new radio network that will have additional capabilities to be a good opportunity to also define and to develop uh, a, a robust operating procedures. Uh, CVPSA governance was, was certainly... Um, you know, not within the total within the scope of of our project. However, it's uh, you know being uh, you know the leading tenant on the interoperability continuum, and because governance is so vital uh, for sustaining and for achieving and sustaining uh, uh, robust uh, public safety communications, you know we we endeavor to to provide some recommendations, and we developed some, and heard some requirements from folks, but. Certainly, you know, CVPSA needs to uh, uh, define its role in funding and procurement and operations uh, of, of uh, the, the communication systems within the region. Um, and um, you know, perhaps uh, a, a charter change to support town membership, that was uh, a conversation that some of uh, the, the leadership had mentioned. Um, also, there was a request for greater fire chief participation uh, on the board, and 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 um, that's something that that you know should be considered going forward. Um, committees and subcommittees and working groups uh, they can be very they prov provide uh, extend your capabilities to uh, assess and and to deliver um, precise uh, information to guide executive board decision making, and uh, we would certainly recommend that you leverage those to the best interest of. Of, of, uh, of your ongoing efforts uh, um, on communications for public safety. So with that said, uh, we'll uh, let uh, Dom talk about uh, the regional and mobile radio network. So, you know, what we started out was to provide a, a, a plan. I mean, we assessed uh, the, what the existing uh, networks and, and plan networks, and we had a chance to visit sites. So we we wanted to provide um, guidance uh, on on the the future evolution of the radio network, and um, Don is, uh, will take us uh, through a few slides to talk about that. Yes, thanks, thank you, Rick. Uh, cer certainly, since the regional network for uh, uh, Capital Fire is such a key uh, uh, recommendation to improve the uh, communications, uh, we want to go into a little bit more detail. Uh, about uh, how we feel that should be structured. Uh, mu much of this concept uh, too has already been uh, discussed and uh, envisioned by uh, uh, many of the uh, uh, key stakeholders within central Vermont. They have been uh, working on uh, similar uh, goals uh, towards this network. So, so this was something that, that uh, uh, we had discussed with them and had uh, maybe taken an extra step to further define what we feel the regional system should look like. Essentially, we are recommending uh, what we're calling a dual simulcast, dual simulcast system. Uh, simulcast, uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, uses multiple tower sites to transmit information to expand uh, the coverage of you know, an individual tower site. We, we use multiple sites. And instead of using different frequencies at the different sites, uh, utilizes the same frequency at each site. So it simultaneously broadcasts the same information over a larger area. That's where the term simulcast comes from. This uh, would be a great advantage over the current system uh, because the current system, while using multiple sites, uh, only is able to transmit off of one at a time. And uh, it, it is uh, kind of a complex uh, scenario. It lengthens the response time when, uh, a, uh, when multiple agencies, for example, have to be alerted of an incident. It may take uh, uh, 
repeat of the uh, of the page or, or of the uh, dispatch over multiple sites. Uh, that is difficult. Uh, it is prone to error and also lengthens the response. Simulcast would eliminate that. You would be able to broadcast the information throughout the entire area at one time. And it would eliminate a lot of the congestion as well because all agencies would be hearing the same information. Now we refer to it as a dual simulcast system because uh, uh, it we feel it makes sense to have the uh, capital fire uh, response time in the rural areas out into the outer towns, as I'll call them, uh, to be separate from the activity within the city areas. Uh, the city areas uh, have, have uh, a little bit, they have somewhat different requirements in terms of greater in-building coverage. Uh, so we feel it makes uh, sense to have two different simulcast cells. One would be, uh, we've we feel would be a three site simulcast system for the city. Uh, it would uh, provide uh, greater in-building coverage in the city where it's needed, uh, where you have more robust uh, building and building construction. Uh, the outer area for the uh, remaining towns would be a nine site simulcast system uh, to enhance coverage greatly from what I have today. Uh, in addition to that, we do recommend the expanded use of vehicular repeaters. Uh, while the coverage would be much better than what is experienced today, uh, due to the terrain, there will still be some areas that will be difficult to, uh, for a portable radio user to communicate back with dispatch. In those scenarios, a vehicular repeater can extend the coverage and create that link from that portable radio user back to dispatch. As we mentioned earlier, we think separate frequencies are uh, key to uh, uh, reduce congestion from what you have today and to provide uh, uh, the uh, necessary communications capability for the two different areas. Uh, even, even though there's two different areas, excuse me, there's, uh, we recommend a common core and voting system uh, so that uh, that would be an efficient use of the uh, equipment and reduce uh, uh, duplication if necessary. Uh, so the diagram on the uh, right side of the screen, I'm sorry, on the left side of the screen shows uh, the common uh, voting system, common core, and the two different uh, thermocast cells. Okay. Uh, both the dispatch facilities would be connected to the common infrastructure uh, so that this would uh, efficiently utilize that equipment and also provide redundancy for the activity. Uh, so either dispatch facility, Perry City or Montpelier would be able to uh, dispatch and to communicate either in the city area or in the more rural town areas. Uh, so if one, if there were to be a, a catastrophe at one piece app, the other could take over and, and Rick, or is there a question? No, maybe we need to get somebody can on I, here. Can I ask everybody to mute themselves? Thank you. If so, here, let me see. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Uh, go ahead, Rick. Next uh, slide. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, so uh, I just want to be, uh, make sure we're, we're clear. This is one regional network um, managed by you know one common core with two simulcast cells, and there are separate dispatch channels for for uh, for rural and for the cities. It's a you, you, right now you, you're dispatching everyone off of a, of a common channel. And and you're you know there are there are challenges with uh, with the ability of, of responders to even hear because they for for uh, see for central fire um, uh, responses they have to affiliate with a given tower. However, due to geographic conditions and terrain issues in in central Vermont, they they might need to you know they could be bouncing off of one tower or the other, and they may not really get the transmission. You know, the communication to and from dispatch and to one another that they need. Um, hey, Rick, uh, I have a question. All right. 
I wonder if we should give time for the Barry folks and other participants to comment on where we are. Yeah, sure. A lot of what you're covering is just a summary of your report. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's not a question of time. There's a way to do this like Steve did. He's got his hand raised. So anybody that wants to do so, I'll be more than glad to recognize him. Steve? Uh, yeah, could I, could, uh, again, for the neophyte, uh, uh, common core, what does that mean? Uh, that means uh, one core or, or one centralized uh, switching uh, facility for the radio system. So even though there's two uh, simulcast uh, networks or simulcast cells, uh, as we call them, uh, they would both be controlled by a, a common switching network, uh, which would uh, also allow both dispatch facilities uh, to uh, utilize either of those simulcast networks. Thank you. It's kind of the brains of the operation directing the communication right. path. Right. It's a computer based uh, a decision making process. And I will point out that uh, you mentioned the, the, the separate frequencies, Rick. I will point out that we did review the frequencies available in the central Vermont area. Uh, some of them currently in use, uh, some of them identified already. Uh, the, uh, the stakeholders within the area have done a lot of uh, work towards this goal and have identified a number of the frequencies. Uh, so we believe that uh, there are options to identify the frequencies necessary to facilitate this type of network. Yeah, and, and add to that. So we were evaluating um, a designs and ideas regarding simulcasts that were in process. So while we, you know, we worked with Joe, uh, Joe Allsworth was uh, gracious enough to make himself available on a number of occasions, as well as others in the community. And, you know, they're, they're already advancing uh, the simulcast, uh, analog simulcast network concept. Um, and they were, were taking a path, uh, of, you know, a three procurement path, um, you know, uh, Central Fire, um, uh, uh, Barry City, uh, um, and, and Montpelier uh, Radio up, Upgrade Network, as well as uh, the dispatch consoles. So you know, the concept of consolidating them all into a single procurement and single effort makes a lot of sense. And we'll talk about that a little bit further in the presentation. But but if anyone, you know, anyone wants to raise a question or, or bring their, you know, certainly as Doug has suggested, raise a hand and please, uh, please uh, let us know your thoughts. Uh, I do want to point out that we did develop uh, what we uh, call as a conceptual design uh, for this uh, type of system and uh, mentioned the two simulcast cells. Uh, so we did uh, predict the coverage that would be uh, provided by those cells and by the sites that have been identified. Some of these are existing sites in use today and others are some uh, recommended, uh, recommended by the stakeholders or identified during our site visits. So this particular uh, plot shows the recommend or the anticipated coverage within the city of Barrie and Montpelier uh, with the uh, city system. This utilizes three sites uh, that, that are shown there, uh, Barry Auditorium, which is a current site, uh, Hill Street, and also the uh, 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 Central Vermont Medical Facility uh, building, which we were able to tour. Uh, this particular plot shows what we call a medium in-building coverage. Uh, so this is a fairly substantial uh, amount of signal that is able to penetrate inside buildings uh, within this area. So you can see it totally covers the uh, Barry City, uh, the corridor between uh, Barry and Montpelier, and uh, the vast majority of the uh, Montpelier as well. Uh, next, uh, Rick, uh, we have uh, uh, predicted coverage for the uh, broader system that would be used by Capital Fire out in the towns area. Uh, we're showing three different levels of coverage here uh, because there's uh, different capabilities. Uh, coverage to a mobile radio 
uh, is shown all the way to the left. And, and this envisions the coverage from dispatch to a radio mounted in a mobile vehicle with an external antenna, as well as the coverage back from that mobile radio to dispatch. Uh, that is considered a, uh, a balanced uh, system where the mobile has a uh, high power. Uh, they can be up to 100 watts and uh, communicate uh, as, as far as the, uh, the infrastructure can. Uh, so you see this shows uh, nearly uh, complete coverage uh, throughout uh, the uh, county, Washington County, as well as the additional uh, towns uh, necessary, uh, such as Washington and Williamston and part of Orange, et cetera. Uh, somewhat uh, Jesus. Dom's frozen. Question. Okay, uh, portable outbound, outbound being again from the dispatch to a portable radio. Um, sorry, it looks like I may be getting some uh, uh, internet connectivity problem. Yeah, you are. <laughs> you were frozen uh, for a few seconds. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's uh, slightly less coverage than you'll see to a mobile radio, but still very broad throughout the entire coverage area. Uh, the toughest link for communications is inbound with a portable. Uh, portable has much less uh, power, of course, than a mobile radio or the base station, and also has an antenna uh, that is at a lower height and can be shielded by, uh, uh, by the body when worn on the hip. Uh, so that shows uh, um, a little bit less coverage uh, in that situation, and uh, that is, uh, you know, the uh, the areas of terrain where there is limited coverage here is one reason that we recommend using additional uh, vehicular repeaters to help fill in those areas uh, in those situations. But that's the predicted coverage uh, from the nine site uh, outer system, simulcast system as we would call it. And also one of the items uh, we looked at uh, uh, kind of beyond that uh, two site simulcast cell was to improve the communication from uh, the ambulance in the field to the medical facility. Uh, we spoke with uh, users at uh, Central Vermont Medical Facility and uh, they uh, commonly have difficulty being able to talk to and to hear responses from the ambulance uh, as they are tran uh, transporting patients uh, to the hospital. Uh, they confirmed that they would be able to, uh, you know, improve service greatly and to be able to better prepare for the arrival of the patient if they could hear the ambulance more, uh, more reliably. Uh, they are using a particular frequency used for uh, medical communications, and right now it is only being transmitted and received from that one location, um, which is uh, uh, in the city of Montpelier, the uh, CVMC or the medical facility. Uh, so that's the uh, in, uh, predicted coverage today uh, shown on the left there from that single facility. Uh, we would recommend adding additional receivers at some of the other sites uh, that we are recommending for the regional network to help broaden that coverage so that the, uh, uh, so that the medical professionals at the hospital can hear uh, what's uh, the, uh, the needs of the patient as they are being transported. So that would re require just adding uh, additional receivers at three locations in order to greatly broaden that coverage and to uh, uh, pretty much blanket the response area for capital fire. And that's the plot we show on the right of the screen. And uh, one, one more thing I want to uh, discuss regarding this uh, uh, process. There has been some discussion as to how to move forward, what are the next steps for this uh, regional system design. Uh, a typical LMR project uh, will follow uh, a three-phase effort, uh, as we are familiar with. 
there will be the first phase, which is identifying what the needs are, uh, what the uh, what the public safety practitioners in the area need uh, to uh, enhance and to provide them with reliable communications. Uh, that's the first phase, the needs assessment, and that typically also includes a concept design, as we have shown here, uh, which is a uh, high-level design uh, indicating how the needs can be met. Uh, we would normally transition to a phase two, which is shown in the center of the screen, which is the procurement uh, uh, portion. Uh, but the procurement also includes uh, engineering from the vendor and, a, and a, uh, a more detailed design. It's still high level, but it's a more detailed design. Uh, so during that procurement process, uh, the uh, uh, the users identify what their needs is what their, their needs are. Uh, they uh, capture that in an RFP, which is sent to interested vendors. The interested uh, vendors normally go through a fairly lengthy design process using their specific equipment, uh, so they can identify exactly what is needed to meet the requirements specified in the RFP. That's what we recommend as the as the next step to move to, move to the phase two procurement and vendor engineering process. And then that phase typically ends in uh, uh, a contract uh, between uh, the municipality or, be, or between the uh, procuring entity and uh, the vendor. Uh, then phase three would be uh, even further detailed design. So detailed design down to the nuts and bolts of what it's gonna take to implement it and actually performing the implementation. Uh, so, so what we ha what we have done here uh, in our report is documenting the needs and providing a conceptual design. So, essentially, the phase one uh, of the process, and and recommending moving forward to the uh, uh, phase two and eventually phase three. Can I ask a question, I ask a question here? Yes, certainly. Uh, Vendor, vendor engineering, does that include all the connectivity, uh, media diversity, uh, redundant routes, geographically diverse routes? Is, are they basically becoming telecommunications engineers as well as equipment salespeople? Or is there two different engineering tasks there? Uh, no, that is uh, the, the engineering test uh, of, of the vendor. Uh, the, 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 the vendor or the land mobile radio provider, such as uh, L3 Harris or Motorola, they have dedicated engineering teams uh, part of this uh, that are part of the procurement process or part of their proposal process. So typically this uh, RFP process will be multiple months, could be two or three months uh, uh, during that time frame when the vendor would go through that, that design process. They would uh, they would visit uh, the area, tour the sites. Uh, they would identify what connectivity options there are, uh, if there is fiber connectivity, or they will engineer microwave connectivity where possible. So yes, they will go through that process and they will document all of that uh, so that they can put together a, uh, a design proposal with, uh, with their cost proposal as well. So that's a, a, a pretty detailed process. Thanks. Okay, so um, let's transition to you know, system cost analysis and, and recommended next steps. Um, um, and any questions before we move on? I know we're taking a little bit more time on the presentation than we anticipated, but uh, we're answering some questions, but this is brings us into the home stretch. And, um, uh, we, you know, we've been requested to, you know, provide these recommendations. So let's, uh, you know, let's cover some of the key considerations. Um, through um, through our, our telecommunications uh, assessment project and, and validating what has already been um, presented by a number of, uh, of, of knowledgeable people, there are, are, are existing communication gaps for, for public safety that require immediate attention. Um, there, there is an issue of, of safety, not only for the communities that are served, uh, for the first responders who are relying on those networks to, uh, 
um, to do their their work uh, with a particular focus on the on the uh, firefighters uh, within the the central Vermont. Um, so you know CVPSA and its member entities need to agree on a viable source of funding, um, and um, you know that that's uh, there are multiple options on how to do that, and I'll talk about that a little bit in, a, in another slide or two. Um, as I mentioned previously, you know the management uh, of a procurement of a regional system through a single RFP has that certainly has financial, administrative, and operational benefits. Um, and, and we recommend that, you know, what we, in going forward, that we consolidate, uh, that you consolidate this to the best of your, your governance ability. Um, there are certainly additional opportunities to forge partnerships with utilities and broadband municipal entities, and they should be further explored. Um, we, we've got a good beginning on those, and we created um, some, and, and we identified um, um, the contacts, and they are interested at both a, a technical and executive leadership level um, to assist uh, to assist uh, you and the region, however they can, and, and certainly they should be further explored. We we're also hey, Rick, Rick, does that have to happen before the RFP is put out in order to inform? The RFP. You're talking about for the the partnerships. Yeah, especially Washington Electric, which is kind of building fiber along all of their right of ways. Uh, I would. We would highly recommend. I mean, what we've begun and what we've documented is a good beginning. But um, we, our goal really was to identify if if there were parties that were interested, and and would they be interested? And yes, it should be part of an undertaking to determine what they have. We've had a couple of meetings. Um, um, well, we have one meeting with CB, uh, CB Fiber um, and a follow-up discussion with them. Uh, I, I'm not sure what, you know, I know that, that Washington Electric may have some help, but they, they had just made a change in their, in their director of, uh, of technology, and that new individual wasn't as up to speed um, as, as uh, we needed to, you know, we need for them to be, but they're very interested um, the Vermont um, uh, uh, Velco uh, is, has got a lot more, uh, is very promising. In fact, as Dom said, they actually own, I think, they own three of the towers, or are they, do they own those towers, Dom, or are they just using them as towers? They, they own one of them specifically, uh, and they're uh, located on, on three of them. Uh, they have a generator at, at one of them that uh, could potentially support the regional system as well. Yeah. I, I, I mean, right now we have a single um, connectivity to our tower sites. Uh, typically, for public safety grade, you you connect to uh, your your most of your sites are connected back to dispatch via um, a, a, tel a telco connection, and and it's coming from one central office. Um, typically, in public safety, you'd have a, a ring network so that you know, or you'd have at least two connectivities per site. Um, right now, you're, you're, you're fortunate to have one, uh, but yes, redundancy could be achieved using a microwave or some of that fiber as well. Um, so yes, th those relationships should be further explored. Um, they could be done in parallel with putting together an RFP. Well, Rick, why this is relevant is that the uh, existing general manager of Washington Electric is now the chair of the state new broadband board. And the Velco uh, guy who built the fiber network, Dan Nelson, is also on that board. So that state board is going to have three or four hundred million dollars over the next few years to play with. And it, this would be an argument for integrating public safety planning into their efforts. Yeah, so. I, I, they, I appreciate that that, that insight. Um, they uh, Washington Electric was very very motivated to want to participate. Um, they, we have meetings with their engineers and they have their VP of engineering or, or the VP, uh, system VP on who made them uh, available to us. So uh, that came in very late. We were, we, we had tried to reach out to them earlier in the process, but in the last few weeks of finishing the report, um, we, we were able to make contact with them, had a couple of meetings and um, uh, yes, we certainly recommend that they, um, they, they could be very helpful. They could help reduce some of our costs and 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 also uh, provide some some uh, partnership. However, their radio network um, is in a different frequency band. It's in a non-public safety band, so we can't really use their frequencies. 
but we could use their backhaul and, and towers um, and other support that they're already providing to some other uh, public safety entities in the state that they shared with us. All right, so uh, utilize established governing structure. I mean, you very you have a very solid governing structure right now. I mean, you 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 put a lot of commitment into your governance. Uh, you meet on a regular basis. You have uh, functional activities. Uh, you've supported, you know, developing this uh, this this uh, the, this needs assessment, and and you now have more tools. But you know, you, what is the role of of uh, CVPSA going forward? And you know, the, it it's it could be there to facilitate decision making and procurement and ongoing operational support and management. But you know, these are you know these are decisions that you're going to have to weigh and evaluate. And and I've got some more insight on that coming up. Um, one of the things we certainly recommend. I mean, obviously you've got to find capital to build this. You know, the, to upgrade your your communication systems. But you also need to identify adequate annual operational funding. All too often, we see that you know we find money to build and to deploy a new system, but we overlook the, its ongoing annual operations. Who's paying to maintain it? Um, and uh, something that you know you want to be sure that you don't overlook the the, the operational expenditure needs as, uh, in addition to the capital expenditure needs. All right, so what, what I want to do now is I want to give you, a, a, go over a little bit about the funding, um, you, know, the, 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 you know, what we've, uh, we've our, our goal really was to segment the, the investments required um, into line items that, you know, could stand alone and you could decide on them independently. Um, we were always, we we're also asked to give Televates recommended priority for these um, and you know certainly these are just the recommendations. You're 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 going to need to make these decisions um, based on uh, a funding availability and what your community um, thinks is you know is are the priorities. So you know our our highest priority that we believe is really the regional radio network. Um, as we've mentioned, uh, Steve, you have a question, sir. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I, just backing up to your last slide. Yes, uh, of course. Yes. Yeah, the, the, the first bullet, communications gap. Communications gaps require immediate attention. Could, could you put that in context in terms of what are those gaps and what does immediate mean? I mean, is that three months, six months, 12 months? Well, you know, we wanted to raise some urgency to this need because this is a conversation that I believe that your region has been having for some time. Um, the, the, the urgency is, is that particularly for your, your uh, particularly for capital fire and, and regional communications, as well as there are problems downtown uh, and buildings uh, for the cities, but they they do not have a functional radio network and it is it, it they 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 really have to do a lot of workarounds to get that system to perform properly so when you say when you say they do you mean capital fire i'm talking about the firefighters that rely on that network for for providing um service yes okay and 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 of course you know the dispatchers within Barry City and Montpelier that need to dispatch to them. It, it also creates a burden on them as well. So they are, you know, they're you're all part of the same, um, uh, uh, in, you know, network of communications. Uh, I appreciate that they they they, you, they represent different communities and and funding uh, of, of pools. But overall, uh, we looked at this as a regional. Uh, uh, effort. The needs in the city in terms of communication are in building coverage. There's some limitations on in building coverage there that need to be addressed. Um, as and, and so in the region, uh, within the, 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 the service area of Capital Fire, um, the, the, the service issues are, are even more uh, degraded. Um, and so immediate attention really means as quickly as we can foster the time and, and and identify the funding to advance this is what immediate needs. I, I, 
it's already been bounced around a long time and we would encourage you to um, use this use our recommendations and findings in this report to build upon them uh, uh, as as quickly as reasonably possible and uh, I can't tell you what that means but I I wouldn't let this uh, uh, simmer too long. Uh, unfortunately, we have seen communities where they they were sitting on a, a powder keg with their communication systems, and 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 an incident um, that didn't go well because communications, and it became uh, finger pointing who's responsible and why didn't we fix these what we knew already? And we we'd hate to see you fall in that kind of situation. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. All right, so here, so as I said, line items on these uh, these items here, and 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 we were asked for Televate to prioritize them, as I mentioned, and I, you know, we used a one, two, three, um, you know, highest, uh, uh, middle, lowest priority, but um, you know, you whoever assesses this may have a different opinion, um, but you know, we we certainly placed uh, radio, uh, the Lambo radio networks as, as the highest need here. Um, and, and that includes in, in our budget there includes radio networks, uh, support for the procurement process, project management, some governance, and of course the construction of the network. Um, the the next item here is tower upgrades and reinforcement. And we you know we put together a budget of three hundred thirty thousand, but we 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 can't validate um, if and where these are required. Um, you know for for instance. Tower loading analysis. Uh, we 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 phys we visually inspected towers and reviewed them, but we can't tell you um, if those towers need to be upgraded or reinforced to support uh, the additional loading that could come up, come about from a new radio network. So we 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 put a budget together here uh, based on potentially new towers, um, or re reinforcing existing towers. Um, leasing and, and upgrading of radio equipment uh, uh, towers. So they'd have to be done in conjunction with the build out of a new radio uh, network. Um, the radio consoles uh, for Montpelier and Barry City Dispatch are, are they have been out of, uh, out of uh, life cycle for some time. Um, they, they are, are quite uh, old. They're, I wouldn't say they're antiquated yet because they're still working, but they, they are not of the latest technology and are not uh, directly supported by the vendor, uh, vendors any longer. Um, and and you're, they're at risk right now. And so they need to be upgraded right now. Excuse me, Rick, uh, yeah. I think Michael may have had a question before. Yes, I, I'm, uh, who's, who's got a question? Paco, did you raise your hand earlier? I have a question, this is George. Who's going to go? I, I, I'll, I'll say, I, I just wanted to make a comment to uh, Steve McKenzie's question. And uh, uh, this, is, this is from myself as project manager and my exposure to this project. And Steve, I'll be, I'll be blunt from what I've seen. When we talk about gaps in immediate attention, I think the uh, fire services radio in central Vermont is problematic and needs immediate attention. The uh, uh, lack of in-building coverage for firefighters in Barry City and Montpelier is a problem. And the congested frequencies and interference for capital fire system is a problem. And those need immediate attention. Thank you, Paco. Thank you. Joe, uh, you have, you have yeah, comments? Th thank, thanks, Paco, that was helpful. This is Jim Ward. Can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I just had a couple of uh, minor technical questions, but I believe I'm driving right now, so I believe my background noise is probably causing you some uh, additional problems. So I'll ask all my questions and then uh, mute my speaker. Um, <clears throat> have you put into the system um, something to get rid of the squelch steel? I know some systems can do that. We used to have something called a reverse tone burst that got rid of the squelch shield, but the, the static um, squelch that happens at the end of each transmission, uh, I, I always found that problematic coming from a system that didn't have it. And, and also, are the ID tones, are they going to be audible? 
uh, that can create the same problem. That's one question. And the second one is, will dispatch be able to simulcast, not the, not the simulcast off the towers for every transmission, but can dispatch simulcast over multiple channels for emergency announcements and so forth? You know, could be uh, dispatch channel, fire ground, command channel, whatever ultimate channels are set up on fire ground. You know, 10 years down the road from now, when they make an emergency announcement, it should go over all frequencies. Uh, and, and the last point I had was Chief Brent last week mentioned if you beef up the, the transmit power of the, uh, the air radio system, the hospital radio system, it could interfere with the other hospitals. Was any um, thought or investigation given to activate, and, or maybe they've already done it, but there's a second air channel. Um, that has never been used, to my uh, knowledge, in this area. But the hybrid pressure used to use the air that's here too as their dispatch channel, which was absolutely illegal, and they did it for 20 years. Uh, the, as far as I know, the entire state's using Air One, which is one one fifty four three four I believe it is one fifty four one I know I can't remember which one. But in any event, was there any uh, research made to maybe put that into this whole mix to activate a second air channel. I'll uh, mute and listen. Thanks for those questions, sir. Tom, you wanna, you wanna take a stab at some of them? Uh, yes, yeah, if I can uh, uh, remember uh, uh, those. Uh, well, uh, the here uh, frequency, uh, um, I was just checking on um, what that was. Uh, we did, uh, discuss the uh, multiple uh, uh, options there. Uh, what we are recommending is additional receivers uh, for the the here uh, channel that's used for communication between the uh, the ambulances and uh, the hospital, and that is uh, the 154. I'm trying to see what uh, what which one that is. Uh, so while you're looking, I'll yeah, I'll one, uh, here too is one that we identified that is uh, potentially available. Uh, we didn't specifically recommend that for anything at this at this point, uh, but uh, but that was something that has been discussed and is a possible option uh, and listed in our uh, uh, frequency channels. Uh, some of your other uh, questions. One was the squelch uh, tail. Uh, we would recommend uh, transitioning to a digital system, to a Project 25 uh, capable system uh, where you would not have that, uh, 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 you would not be hearing the squelch tail. Uh, you know, the, the digital communications uh, uh, does not have uh, that type of, uh, uh, you wouldn't hear background noise, you wouldn't hear the squelch tail, and that would. Uh, improve your communications when you are able to transition to P25. Uh, and uh, the dispatch facilities would have the capability to simulcast off of all of the, uh, uh, the two different networks uh, that we are proposing at, at all towers at once. So the nine site town system or the uh, three site city system, they would be able to simulcast off of off of those uh, and would be able to do that on uh, both of the recommended channels uh, or dedicated channels for those two systems. The yeah, global people. alerts could be sent out over the, any of the channels uh, designated by, by a dispatch. So they could communicate, do a global transmission to anyone who's uh, active uh, on the radio right. network. Yes. Did we get all your questions? Is there something else that we, we may have missed? I don't think he's there anymore, Rick. Okay. I mean, he's there, but he's just listening. Okay, all right. Okay, so um, uh, let's see here. Uh, you got my questions answered. I had to mute again. All right, sir, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your, your interaction. Okay, so TAC channel receivers, I mean, we, you know, the, this one was a very uh, interesting request uh, from the from uh, uh, the fire departments. Uh, the, the the member of the Capitol Fire uh, 
They typically use a, a, a fire ground channel, a tactical channel that cannot be heard back by dispatch. Um, the rationale behind that is, is that you don't have sufficient um, uh, over the air, over the network channels, and also, you know, their process is to go to fire ground to ensure that they've got reliable communications. Um, but they would, you know, certainly they're, they would be safer um, if, if they could be, you know, uh, monitored by dispatch. So the idea of, of, of placing TAC channel receivers at all the sites would allow that reception to be received and to and to be uh, transmitted or, or to be you know uh, uh, communicated back to dispatch so they, they could listen in the event there was an incident um, and, and they needed additional help. So that that is uh, we put together a design for that and a budget. Um, so uh, the same as Dom just talking about for the, the medical um, uh, coverage and interoperability, those three, those, those uh, receivers that, that Dom mentioned, um, I'm, I'm not saying that they're not needed, but um, they were, in our opinion, a little lower priority. Um, and I'm not sure of, of who would pay for those, uh, but that's, you know, that, that's certainly um, um, another item. Uh, portable and mobile radios. Um, yes, I mean, you have a new radio network. If you don't have viable radios, you can't communicate them. They have to be a higher, higher priority. Um, uh, the uh, vehicular repeaters, equipment in the installation, uh, vehicular repeaters uh, would be installed into, um, into apparatus, uh, um, uh, fire, uh, fire engines, uh, fire operators, uh, chief buggies, uh, uh, the police are also currently using them. And they allow you to, uh, to uh, distribute a high power RF in the buildings and increases the reliability. Um, they, you know, they're very beneficial, but um, you, you know, we could, we could put them in a lower priority and see how the new radio network performs. Um, but that's, that's certainly um, a need. Um, the redundant link between the dispatch centers, um, you know, having redundancy is, is certainly mission critical grade, mission critical grade communication. And, and, you know, in the event that you only have one connectivity there and you have a backhoe fade and, and you lose that connectivity, uh, it's certainly uh, uh, more, uh, more robust to have uh, uh, redundant connectivity and, and perhaps some of those uh, relationships with the, with the uh, fiber entities in the state might be beneficial there. Um, you know, public safety broadband applications. I mean, right now, I mean, we, there, your community has got issues with radio, uh, with your radio communications. And if you have limited funding, you know, you're gonna, you, you, if you don't have the, you know, the full amount of funds to do everything that's been recommended, um, you could certainly uh, deprioritize uh, broadband applications and commercial uh, or mission critical push to talk. Um, the computer aided dispatch system, uh, you know, it's, it's, you've not, you're not, you don't have one, you, you know, you need one. Um, could we, could we get by without it? Uh, we'd certainly love to see you have it and you want it, but um, it could be a you know a lower priority. So these are our, our budgetary items for you know uh, for the what we've uh, our recommendation. And and with that said, I, I, I look you know thinking about you know the 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 CBPSA next steps to you know to um, to decide and implement the network. Um, now we'd certainly encourage you to maintain the momentum. Um, you know, we, you, you've been working on this a while. We, we now, you know, there is a documented report, some findings that have been established. Um, and, and, and so it's critical to maintain the, the momentum. However, yes, Rick, yes, I Rick, see some- I got a couple there. of questions here. Uh, yes, first, sir. Steve McKenzie, and second, Dave Rubicon. Right. Yes, sir, Steve. Yeah, Rick, just a general question on the cost. Yes. Well, I understand those are budget costs, um, but I just try to understand what they reflect. Are those basically um, the hard costs? Do those include any soft costs, an allowance for a soft cost for, you know, for the design and, and actually getting to the implementation phase? Yes, sir. Uh, uh, Steve, uh, in the first line item here, we we included um, some funds to um, you know to assist 
you know, to put the procurement together, obviously you got to write an RFP. Um, and, and so there are soft funds for that. There are soft funds uh, for the project management to implement the new radio network, um, as well as with, you know, some, you know, for some guidance to support governance. Uh, construction would be included in, in the, you know, the radio infrastructure, you gotta, you gotta install and maintain it. Well, no, you're not maintain it, but you gotta construct it. So those costs uh, are in there. So in, yeah. in, in that line item, it does include those. Um, and others we've identified installation costs. So, so um, uh, anything here on um, broadband, there are a number of soft costs and applications that we've identified. I mean, you got to host applications and you need IT support and others. So uh, we do have some, some budget in there for that, but, but you're absolutely like you point out that line item one includes uh, uh, a variety of soft costs to support the overall uh, purchase uh, implementation and, and cut over into operation. The other, the other part of that question is, do these budget costs include some uh it, either explicit or implicit um contingency or for for funding planning purposes should uh depending on whatever the authority uh wants to support and try to move forward should the, should there be some contingency added to that 6.4 number uh, or there, is that contingency again part of that number Don, we typically do a 10% contingency. Did, did we include that for, for this? Yes, uh, in, in uh, the majority, if not all of those line items, certainly the regional system, uh, we do have contingency included in that, yes. Uh, thank you. Dave, Dave, please go ahead. Yeah, Dave, hi. Hi, um, for those of you who don't know me, I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm Dave Rubkob, I'm a firefighter paramedic with Barry City, and I'm also a reserve dispatcher with Barry City. Um, a minute ago, you spoke about um, the TAC channel receivers for a fire ground. Yes. Um, and I'm looking at your report. Is it your recommendation to have a single fire ground channel that's monitored? No, we have to, we have to uh, identify the number of uh, TAC receivers, TAC uh, channels available, and we have to ensure that we've got uh, receiver capabilities for, uh, uh, for most, if not all of them. Okay. Um, was it part of the, the scope of the project to examine the, the volume of traffic, um, specifically on the fire channel? Well, we didn't study the, uh, the records, but we, through conversation and through, you know, best practices, um, um, you know, the, since everyone, since that you're dispatching over that channel and, and, and firefighters are also communicating in route because they don't have any other channels, that, that channel is overly congested. Um, so what we recommended was that there be a, a, a separate, uh, you know, over the air communication channel. So you'd have a, one to dispatch over and a, an additional channel uh, that would be used for, for over the air tactical communications, pretty much a communications in route to the scene so that you would take the traffic, that traffic off of your dispatch channel. Okay, uh, I'm just, um, you know, experienced, you know, we have 20 plus departments on that one channel. I think even having one dispatch channel for them, and then even with removing Barry City and Montpelier on their own channel, I'm wondering if one fire ground channel um, is still going to support the future needs. Or uh, the, the list of frequencies that we've identified shows on the order of uh, uh, five uh, frequencies available for fire ground, I believe. Thank you. Is there any um, standards or recommendations for the number that we should have? Well, FCC licensing requirements, you have FCC licensing requirements and you exceed those. In other words, you, 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 you can't um, request and have licensed a, a frequency unless you have uh, X amount of users. So you meet those requirements. Um, you know, the best practices uh, are, are gonna be determined, um, you know, you gotta customize them 
Um, so, you know, we work in some communities where there are 20, 30, uh, 40 uh, volunteer firefighters and, and fire departments in a county, a given county, and they tend to have, um, 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 some of them have their own tactical uh, over, you know, fire ground channels and, and others share them. So, you know, ideally you would, you would have a schema to share, share those channels um, based on some geographic separation of the end users so that they aren't necessarily um, um, stepping on one another, even over their fire ground. Thank you very much. My pleasure. All right. Um, Any other okay. questions I may have missed? My apologies if I missed you. My screen only allows me to see six individuals at a time, and there's 14 here. So right. I have to keep moving my mouth mouse to find out who's hiding. <laughs> yeah, don't be shy about speaking up. All right, so next steps. Uh, as I said, you got to maintain the momentum. And, and, and your challenge is, you know, uh, you're a small community and you all have, you know, full-time responsibilities. Uh, you don't have, you know, folks who are dedicated to one particular item here. So in order, in order to do, you know, in order to maintain the momentum, we're going to have to find a way to dedicate the time I think you have the energy, but do you have the time? And who are the those folks? And I, I, you know, coming slides will talk a little bit more about it. But you know, there's also a need to reach consensus on a strategy to address and mitigate public safety communication gaps and requirements. I've got a lot of strong minds there, a lot of brilliant people who have good ideas. And 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 how do we achieve consensus on which way to go? Um, you know, ideally, the the report was will, will help consolidate that and, and, and provide you with guidelines, but, but reaching consensus in, in a, in a uh, strong-willed uh, um, and, and, and talented group of people is not always easy to do. Um, and that's, uh, you know, that's going to be an important challenge for you. Um, you know, we're, we're recommending establishing stakeholder working groups as it's a common best practice in public safety um, you know, in, in, in making decisions and, and managing um, communication systems. So, you know, you're going to need, we're going to need to provide technical recommendations, uh, secure funding and, and governance uh, structure roles and responsibilities. And then, you know, ongoing further, once we have the, ne the network and even today, uh, implementation and operations of the radio network. So these are, you know, these are key, you know, uh, next steps that, that also, you know, you're going to have to, you know, uh, uh, prudently manage. So, you know, what we've provided are some next step recommendations. Uh, uh, before I go on, does anybody have a question? All right, so what, what do you do next? I mean, you've got to make a decision. Um, we've given, you know, the report uh, 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 consolidates uh, re requirements and, and identifies recommendations to those requirements, puts a budget, um, gives you some budgetary numbers for them. But what do you do? Well, you know, we're recommending a technical working group be established. Um, it should have, um, you know, broad membership, but it shouldn't be too big that it can't, you know, function. But there's some recommendations on, on who the members should be. And, and as we know, and as we, as Televate has witnessed in many, many markets we worked in, same people tend to always be the ones that step up. And um, so, you, you're, you know, the technical working group would evaluate the various technical solutions that have been proposed, prioritize them, um, and then, you know, document and provide your recommendations to a, a board that's going to make the final decision. In, in parallel, I recommend a finance working group that should have membership uh, from the cities, uh, from CFMAS, and from, from perhaps from the towns if they're, they're also invited to come in. But you know, you've got to have uh, folks that, that understand funding and, 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 and how, to, how to secure funding. Um, they need to assess funding options for both capital expenditures, CapEx, and operational expenditures. Um, and cer certainly to advance the most viable of those options. Um, we got to match the funding plan to the technical working group recommendations. So the working group says we need all of these incentives and other, um, you know, that's uh, a $6 million plus uh, budget. 
if we if we narrow the focus and say, well, we can start here and over time expand, then that budget changes. But we got to match our, our funding options to the recommendations. And then we got to determine a procurement strategy. Um, you know, will the procurement be managed by one of the cities or the other or another entity? But you know, you, you're going to have to reach agreement on that. Um, and, and perhaps it's one, perhaps it's multiple, but, but these are the decisions that really, I think w w could be and should be advanced by a finance working group. Uh, they're really on the governance working group. The governance working group, uh, you know, could start sooner or later. I mean, the, 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 the uh, two working groups above have got the most important uh, 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 heavy lift in the beginning. But governance is also a, a challenge and it, it becomes a foundation and, and, and structure to what you're doing. So um, membership, uh, CBPSA, executive board, city legislature and the towns, if they, if they can join, uh, I know they're not members of it. They are CB, uh, Capital Fire represents the towns, but um, there's been discussed uh, by, by, by some board members that it might be prudent to invite them on to and modify the charter. But, you know, it, it, you know, you do need to change your organizational structure. Um, and, and what is the role, ongoing role and responsibilities? Um, also, um, you know, there has to be a decision made on regional radio network operations. Who, who's going to be the entity responsible for the operations? And, and I know you have, have that fairly solidified right now, but you might reconsider going forward. Um, and then a, another long term doesn't need to be done now, but um, there are some activities that could be done on their operations side, but an implementation and operations working group um, that manage, manage and facilitate system implementation, um, develop, uh, uh, um, recommend uh, standard operating procedures, and, and provide uh, oversight of operations and maintenance, the O&M oversight. All right, so with that said, um, that concludes uh, our presentation. And, and I don't know if, if there is some, uh, um, uh, Doug, if you'd like to you know, facilitate some open discussion, um, this would be a good time to do it. Well, first Rick, of all, Rick, can you unshare your screen? Yes. Up, oh, wrong way. Okay. There you go. Great. First of all, Dom and, and, and Rick, thank you very much uh, for your fine efforts not only tonight, but over the last few weeks to put together this report. Um, I think it's going to take a few minutes for everybody involved to digest it. Um, and I would certainly encourage uh, the good folks like Doug and Joe, uh, Sally, to share the report with uh, their constituents. I think getting feedback from the folks that are in the in the field can make all the difference in the world. Um, and you may hear something that you didn't hear when you were doing the original stuff. Um, having said that, if there are any questions that any other people have, this would be a good time. Carrie, Paco, Paco raised his hand. Yeah, I Doug, I, I just I just want to make a uh, a quick comment. First of all, I, I want to uh, uh, thank Joe Walsworth, who did uh, an exceptional job at help. Uh, we lost you, Paco. It's so hot outside that Paco's frozen. <laughs> He's right. Very good job. They were very easy to work with. Uh, it ended up being a, uh, I think, a comprehensive report. But more importantly, it was a report that met all of the uh, provisions of the contract. And I want to make that clear. Uh, they delivered what was asked of them as stated in the contract. So thank you all, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Chief Brett. 
Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Great. Um, I wanted to say with everybody on board here, what a great job Rick and Dom did. I really think that they came to Vermont and I mean, however they came either via computer or actually set foot on the ground here. They really did a good job at summarizing what's going on here, what our weaknesses are and where we need to go with this. Uh, I, I think they hit it out of the park as far as their report goes. And I wanted to make sure that the CVPSA members knew that their money was very well spent, that Montpelier and Barry's money was very well spent. Uh, and um, we, we got a heck of a heck of a good report. And I just wanted to put that on the record. Thank you, Chief. Oh, thank you very much, Chief. Thank you, sir. Sally, you got anything to add in here? Yeah, I don't have a raise my hand thing for some reason tonight. But anyways, um, <laughs> my only I just had a couple comments from the communications committee that had reviewed this um, prior to tonight's meeting. Um, a couple of things. One, the dollar amount is a lot compared to what Capital Fire was looking at. So whatever there is for funding, there's going to have to be, I would think, some grants or something like that. It's, I think it's going to be a hard sell for some of the small communities um, if we can't get some outside funding. Um, and the two simulcast systems, I think that got answered. So if they can be patched together, because otherwise we're kind of going away from what we were looking at as far as having one channel, not having to constantly switch towers. Um, and is that correct? Okay. Yes. Yes. Simulcast network. You won't have to. The network will determine where you are, and you will. You won't have to pick a a, a radio tower. Okay. Um, and and I didn't want to scare. We didn't want to scare you away with the pricing. I mean, we have uh, obviously we reviewed um, the previous uh, uh, proposal that was provided and understand the pricing of that. The 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 new the the new proposed network has three different additional radio towers that you know in in collaboration with uh, with Joe. Um, you know, we identified a number of other holes that he was familiar with, and he felt that the original design wouldn't satisfy, and we modeled those, and, and so this, this, the new network does have more towers, um, and, and that, that 2.9 also includes um, probably uh, half to three quarters of a million dollars in additional um, uh, soft expenses. And then the only other comment is as far as the Valcor system goes, I know Paco said that they've got some dispatch stuff coming unless they've got a miracle coming in the next few weeks. Um, State police is going live September 12th. And as a dispatcher, it's horrible. It's a, it's not a computer aided dispatch system at all. So they've got a lot of work to do um, to make it user friendly. Mm. That's it. Uh, that's unfortunate. I don't know if Paco's talking to somebody else or talking to us. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, he's not muted. He's not muted, so I think he's trying to talk to us, maybe. Oh, okay. He's <laughs> trying. There you go. No. Still can't hear you. He said, go ahead. Yeah, move ahead. All right. A anybody else? Let's do questions, uh, uh, comments? Uh, yeah, Kim? Yes, sir. Yeah, Doug, I just want to add my support for the work you've done and you've clearly outlined the problems ahead of us, but you've given us a way to think about them. And I think with goodwill, we can do it. Sally, funding is always a critical issue. And uh, there's gotta be various sources that we can work on um, as far as I'm concerned, that's our job in the next three or four months. See if we can come up with some proposals for town meeting that at least get us started on that road. I don't think we'll have a solution in that time period, <laughs> but I think we can be well on the way to seeing a way to move forward. Yes, Sally. Sally, go ahead. More question. Um, so yeah, as far as that goes, I know the communications committee in our discussions have said that by spring of 2022, we would like to be moving forward um, 
actively. This is a dire situation, as they've said, um, but dire, we don't think can wait a few years. So we'll see what we can, can do for funding. Well, if I, can... I think that's a great goal and we should work towards it. I agree with you. This is desperate. We need change and we need to move it quickly. Joe Osworth, you got your hand up. Go ahead, Joe. Unmute, Joe. There you go. So I, I've had the unique uh, opportunity to work with Dom and Rick uh, probably from the get go in Paco. And uh, I mean, they did identify our weaknesses uh, in the system, which uh, we are taking steps uh, slowly. But I think it's important that the report solidifies the work that has already been done. Uh, and, and now it gives some, some really meat on the bone to move forward on. So I, I just, I appreciate Dom and Rick. I don't have any other questions because I was able to ask my questions immediately and get the response that I needed. Um, so I just applaud both of them. Uh, they did they did exceed the uh, the RFP and uh, it was a pleasure to work with both of you guys. Thank you, sir. It's our pleasure. Certainly, a feeling is mutual. It's uh, you know, working with uh, a dedicated and uh, exceptional personnel like like all yourselves that uh, you know makes us enjoy what we do. Uh, uh, there's uh, Steve. Do you have another question, sir? It wasn't a question, more of a comment. Uh, I don't know what funding availability there will be in the infrastructure bill coming down the pike, um, but that we'll certainly have to examine that as a potential funding source. Absolutely. Sounds like you might want to be the chair of the finance committee or the finance working group. <laughs> I'm, I'm retiring in 10 months. I don't see it in the cards. <laughs> I, I'm actually, if we don't have a procurement out on the street and make a decision within 10 months, we'll never meet uh, Sally's objective to have the network, a new network up and running in, uh, well, in, in 2022. We, that's why I say this is, this is urgent. You folks are, are sitting on a powder, a powder keg over there. Uh, I, I, we, uh, we already know the burden that you're under. So uh, hopefully you know, the idea of, of, of having some, you know, having a tool in hand now, a document that helps guide you. But but uh, I, just to reiterate what Joe Allsworth said, we we valid, we did validate what work was already being gone. So we want to give credit to where credit's due. Um, the, the first responder community in, in central Vermont was advancing uh, a, a, a viable plan. And, um, you know, we've enhanced that plan um, 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 but but it was a, a good work in process, and I think you know you certainly we revalidated that. Um, and with that said, if there's no more questions, I just want to again express our, our uh, appreciation for the opportunity to work with you on this project. Um, I, I want to give special thanks uh, to uh, to Kim Kim Tenney, uh, to Donna Bay, to Doug Hoyt, certainly to Joe Allsworth, uh, Chief Brent. And, and to Paco Almond, uh, uh, among others that we interacted with on a regular basis. So we, uh, Paco gave us a, a lot of important insight regarding uh, Central Vermont, regarding CVPSA, and 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 you know facilitated uh, a, a variety of meetings that were critical. Uh, Joe, um, from from day one, he was uh, he was kind of running the show. I mean he. He provided uh, Dom uh, and I enough insight that we were able to figure it out. But, but we would regularly come back to him and try to understand how this or that worked. And um, you know, he's the brain trust over there. He, along with uh, with Chief Brent, you know, they they uh, they really understand their radio communication systems. And so we really appreciate having uh, worked and having the opportunity to work with you. Uh, ideally, um, funding is available, and we we will main, be able to maintain a relationship with the, you know with you all going forward. Um, but we we it's been an honor. We've created some some you know what I think are are, are lifelong friendships uh, uh, with some of the people that we've interacted with. And um, I have been to Vermont enough times to know that it's paradise. Uh, 
Um, yeah. Summer, winter, spring, fall. You guys have beautiful. It's a beautiful place to be. Um, I, uh, I I admire you all for for uh, where you live and the, you know, the place you're living in. The Green Mountains of Vermont uh, are near and dear to us. So uh, thank you again, and uh, hope whatever we've done uh, is uh, beneficial to uh, protecting the you know the communities that you serve and the first responders that serve those communities. You're most welcome, guys. I really, really appreciate it. Um, I'd like to go back to the uh, agenda. Um, the next item on the agenda is item number four. It's approved payments to Francis Paco Hallman of $2,325 for a Televate project management and federal grant. Uh, the last part of that. Donna Bate, $146 uh, for CVPSA post office box 634 annual fee. And to Brent Householder, $278.89 for CVPSA Zoom account. And $158.89 to CVPSA DocuSign. Uh, Brent's distributed the warrants. Uh, I'd like to believe that everybody except for one board member has signed them. Um, I'm not so sure I'm buying into the concept that just because it didn't get posted on the city clerk's bulletin board, I think we can move forward and approve these payments uh, to the people who have served us well. In that case, I would entertain a motion to do so. Have all the board members signed uh, their consent? I Brent, have. I have. Everybody, everybody has except for myself, and I plan to do so. Then I move payment. Second. A second. Yeah, a second. Okay. All right. Num number five, which we have gone through. Uh, very well. <clears throat> and number six is the board needs to accept the Televate approve and approve final payment. Um, this is a big ticket item. Um, and again, I'm not necessarily having a great deal of heartburn over the fact that uh, the notice of this meeting would, did not make it on to the city clerk's bulletin board. And I can assure you that the board will look into that as to why that did not happen. Um, I guess I would ask uh, Dom and, and, and uh, Rick if they have an issue with us delaying the payment for a brief week or two in order for us to get that ship square it away and have a formal approval by the board. I'm also open to the option of going ahead and approving it now. So, uh, uh, sir, uh, before uh, uh, you hear from your, your board members, um, we, you know, we will uh, we'll accept whatever is, uh, you know, appropriate time for the board to do um, what it's, you know, appropriate actions are. So if we're, if our, of our payments delayed uh, for a few more weeks or a month or whatever, we we can manage that. Um, and um, you know, so uh, it's it's up to you. You're however you want to do it is going to work for us. Well, I I sincerely and deeply apologize for this. Uh, I'm I'm not an individual that likes to hold people off personally or professionally. Uh, you've you earned it. You've done it. I mean, you've heard that. Uh, outstanding appreciation. Um, I can think of no reason why you should not have this approved. Doug, there is an alternative. We could uh, approve the payment tonight and ratify it in two weeks, and it would take about that much time to process the payment. So I can buy we, into we that. We approve the payment subject to ratification at our next meeting. Now I can buy into that. And if that be the case, then I'd like to see a motion to accept the report 
and to approve uh, the uh, payment. That's my motion. So just to be clear, are we, we have a motion on the table for <clears throat> payments to myself, Donna, and Paco. You're right. I guess we need to take that one up first. Oh, I thought that was approved. I'm not so sure. Let's double it and make sure that it is approved. I move everybody, it's approval. Everybody, everybody recalling that original motion uh, for Paco, Donna, and Brent to uh, say yeah, yay or nay. Yay. Yay. All right. That motion carries. Now we'll go back to the one we were just talking about, and that's to approve and accept the uh, Televate report and approve final payment. And we have a motion, and I think we're waiting for a second on that. Again, I'm hearing a motion. I'm not hearing a second. So, Sal, you, was you second. I'm second. I'm sorry. That's all right. No problem. Who made the motion? Kim. Kim. Kim made the motion. Sally made the second. Subject Any discussion? Application at the next meeting. Right. Any discussion? Hearing nothing, all those in favor say aye. Aye. And opposed. Hearing none, motion carries. Um, next item is uh, other business. Has anybody got something that was not on the agenda or something that has come up during the evening that they would like to bring up? Again, not hearing any, I guess we're ready to move on. And I would just like to encourage everybody that's participating. One of the things that came up in our discussions as a group with Dom and other people on the, on the report was the urgent need to prioritize the things that are in the report. There is certainly a lot of information in there and more than enough to make Steve McKenzie looked to retire sooner, but <laughs> most of us that have been involved in this process over the years recognize that $6 million does not grow on the apple tree and there's a need to prioritize, convince our constituents what the priorities are and to have a big project in mind and put it in phases. So. There's a lot of work to do. I wish us all the best of luck. Not hearing anything else, I guess I'm ready to close the meeting. So, so uh, Doug, just before we close, I will forward out a copy of this presentation so that you can distribute to your membership. So I'll make sure we get that first thing in the morning. Thank you very much. Rick, could you co correct the uh, slide that says uh, Central Fire Mutual Aid to Capital Fire Mutual Aid? Yes. Sorry about that. Thanks for the. Thanks for picking that up. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Have a great Thank day. You. Thanks again. Thanks. Take hope care. To see you. In, hope hope to see you soon. Everybody. Yeah.